Hey, I'm early this week. I got a lot going on this week, and uh, looks like we're having the portables. will be fully uh, up and running, hopefully by Friday, if not a week from today, Monday. So I'm going to go ahead and get this Sunday Bible study out of my way so that I've got, to, I've got a big recording to make for chapel. We're having to do our chapel services for the school virtually. And so I'm kind of going out of the box and instead of sitting here like I have been with you all these weeks for Sunday Bible study, uh, I'm going to attempt something uh, totally out of the box and uh, roaming around, selfie stick, you know, videotaping. And um, so pray for me this week. It's going to be a pretty heavy week. Also, Lynn, Lynn uh, uh, Dean, uh, she's got pancreatic cancer. Uh, they transported her from Rockledge over to the Advent Hospital there in Orlando, formerly Florida Hospital, and uh, she's undergoing surgery as we speak right now. I just got off the phone with Kenny, her husband, been married less than a year, and a second marriage for both of them, and uh, they're still on their honeymoon, um, and, and then find out she's got cancer, pancreatic cancer, and uh, so they're putting in some stents. Uh, they're going to take some biopsies. Uh, hopefully, if they can, they're going to try to remove a, uh, a mass that's that's there on a pancreas that's blocking uh, the flow there. That, and uh, so pray for her and Kenny. Uh, both of them, uh, she lost her um, husband, Bo, um, a couple of years ago uh, with cancer. And Kenny lost his wife, oh, maybe three or four years ago um, uh, with Alzheimer's. And uh, so both of them had been caring for their mates for many years. And then they got, they fell in love, got married, they bought a camper, a boat, uh, doing things together, just living life, and uh, boom. Uh, so uh, she's come down with this cancer. So please pray for Lynn, uh, uh, Lynn Dean. I want to call her Lynn Morrison. That's her maiden name. Hey, we love you all. And uh, so if you've got your notes out, uh, we're studying, of course, the book Real Christianity. We're in Lesson 10, What is God's Game Plan? And last week we talked about... His game plan number one is the grace plan, and that is living by grace. Uh, the Apostle Paul stated that he was the chiefest of sinners, yet he was called a saint. Uh, he said he was a wretched man, uh, but also he said he, he's a new creature in Christ. And, and so um, Paul is saying we live by grace and grace alone. And so today, another plan of God's, as we are been saved and, and uh, what he is wanting to do in and of us, is called the victory plan. The victory plan. And uh, uh, we read about that in Philippians. But before we do, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, here's another, another week has come. And Lord, we certainly do pray for Lynn, uh, Father, that uh, you would help that surgeon and anesthesiologists, the nurses, the technicians, everybody will be on their game and that, Lord, she can be uh, better. And we are asking for a miracle, God. I I'm bold enough uh, in your grace to say, Lord, please uh, heal her body. Take away the cancer, Father, and um, give her more days here on this earth with her husband, Kenny. And so, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Bless this hour we are, this time we have to be together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the victory plan. We get this from Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Wherefore, my beloved, my beloved, he's talking to the Christians now, Paul is, to the church there in Philippi. And he says, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Three things I want us to look at briefly in this, in this passage here. Number one, uh, they were obeying Christ in the absence of Paul. Now Paul was bold enough to say uh, earlier in our lessons that he was saying you can emulate me. Um, do what I do. That's a bold statement. I, I know he's meaning do do as I do in Christ, not do as I do in my flesh, but do as I do in, in Christ. Uh, second thing, it talks about um, uh, there is to, um, or the third thing actually, is to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You can't work out something that's not already inside of you. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, he's not saying work for your salvation, work out your salvation that you may be saved. No, you are saved, so let's 
it's a process. Behold, all things are become new. And so it's a process. Uh, and, and so that's what he's referencing there. Okay. And um, so also Philippians uh, 12, uh, 13, as we read, it says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And uh, so the will is, is, hey, my will is my desires. Okay. My desire. And to do is the ability to act and behave God's way. So my inner my inner desire ought to be to serve God. As a Christian, I want to please God. But I do not want to do that in and of myself. And what I mean by that is I don't want my efforts. God's, God's saying, let me work in you. Let me work in you. Step aside, Porter. And let me do the, um, the transformation that you need in your life. Let me do that. And so, and how is that done? We, last week, it's God's, God's grace. It's only by the grace of God. So will we do uh, good works after salvation? Sure we will. We better. But it isn't to be done in self-dependence. It is. It, 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 it's not of ourselves or our strength, our own strength. Our good works will be an exercise in utter dependence upon God. Have you ever asked God to do something that was bigger than yourself? Boy, I, I have these past, I don't know, a couple of years. I've, I've, I've seen the hand of God. I, I've seen that a, that a, uh, uh, a $480,000 parking lot Recoding um, was going to cost four hundred eighty thousand dollars. I saw it go from four eighty to three fifty, and, and then I saw the hand of God move um, without us pumping up people, without the thermometer in the in the lobby showing how many how much money people's given, and and taking months and weeks and years to to come up with uh, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Hey, in eight months, in eight months. All three hundred and fifty thousand. It was in the bank. It had already been donated. One one person donated h- half the cost of that, um, and, and we saw the original cost go from four something to three something, and then the final cost uh, it went down to. Let me think now. I think it went down to a hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and that's just by the grace of God. It's nothing that I did. I connived. Nobody else did. It was just, just the way it, it happened. It was a God thing. And then to have one individual say it was one hundred sixty thousand. So one individual said, "I'll give you eighty thousand dollars." One individual said, "I'll give you twenty thousand dollars." Another individual said, oh, "I'll give you five thousand dollars." And then everybody else pitched in. It was marvelous. It was a God thing. And the, the guy that put the parking lot in, he said, you know, Pastor, if you have to pay me off a little bit at a time, we're happy to do this for you. Are you kidding me? I told him, I said, Brother, God has already given us the money. And uh, and so I, I've seen that happen time and time and time again in my own personal life with me and my wife, Becky. And I've seen it do, done in, within the church. L- seeing God do something that we cannot do. That's encouraging. That is encouraging. And that strengthens my faith. Going forward, our effort in the Christian life will be either self-led or it'll be Jesus-led. Uh, I heard a pastor one time, uh, he's in um, um, Knoxville, Tennessee, Clarence Sexton. He said, I don't want to be, I don't want to be driven. I want to be led. I don't want to be driven. I want to be led. And, and that's my heart's desire as well. I don't want to be driven, driven by pressure, driven by success, driven by whatever. I, I want to be led of the Holy Spirit in my life. That's my desire. Do I always do that? No. I'm the first to tell you, I have failed many and many a time. None of us are perfect. But that's my heart's desire, to be led of the Holy Spirit. Listen, He can do a much better job than I can. So we want it to be uh, uh, grace, God's plan of grace and also God's plan of victory for us to set ourselves aside and allow God 
to do do what we cannot do. Oh, we think we can, and we'll muster up every plan, and we'll read every book, and we'll try to connive and scheme and get her done. But it is the total dependence upon God and the Holy Spirit to lead us. Like Paul said, I live, but it's not me. Jesus lives through me. Isn't that great? We live, yes, but it's not its not us. It's Christ living in us that makes a huge difference. The easiest thing to do in a Christian life is, is to get off the grace path and get on the self-serving path, get on the works path, because then it's tangible. I can hold it. I can feel it. I can smell it. I can see it. And, and therefore, I'll get it all together. And by, by George, I'll, we'll work it out. No, allow God to do it to allow God to do it through you and be led of the Holy Spirit. That's a great thing. It's easy to try to please God in self-effort rather than to yield to Him in self-abandonment. It's easy to try to do right in our own strength and flesh. In this, my effort becomes self-dependence, not Jesus' dependence. I don't want to be self-dependent. I want to be Jesus. Dependent. I want. To, I cry out to God every day. God, lead me, guide me, show me where I'm doing wrong, help me, Father, to overcome this flesh that that I live in. Self-glory, not God's glory. Boy, it's easy, man, to get the applaud of men, and not God's glory. It, it causes me. By if I live in my flesh, it causes me to be sinful, not holy flesh not faith me not jesus so killing my self-dependence is a work only god can do we need to pray god kill my self-dependence i want to be wholly and totally dependent upon you he walks with us every day and dealing with us as his children and cultivating our hearts towards this holiness he lovingly reveals our pride i like that he lovingly reveals our pride he allows our struggles to humble us and have you ever i mean i failed and man it's so humbling and i have to go to god and say god i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm so sorry the flesh is so weak i'm so sorry he allows failure to knock us down so he can pick it so he can pick us back up brush us off restore us in grace and help us to go forward in renewed dependence upon jesus wow don't you love that? Don't you love that God God doesn't throw us away? That we're not disposable? That God cares? That God created you? That God knows me? That God cares for me enough to pick me up after I've fallen? A question was asked one time of some, of some priest, and they said, what do you do? And he said, we fall down. But God gives us back up. And that's true. But for the grace of God. We'd stay down. We'd be down and outers. But by God's grace, he picks us up, places our feet on the solid rock, and says, you've got another chance. Go, keep on going. Don't quit. It's wonderful. The Christian life is so wonderful. There's really nothing you alone can do for him. There's nothing that I can do alone for God. But there's a lot that I can do through him, through God. There's a lot you can do through God. There's a lot He can do in us and through us. I want Him to work in us and work through us. So, notice the difference between these two attitudes I'm going to talk about. Live for Jesus or living in Jesus. Live for Jesus or living in Jesus. So living for Jesus. This could be uh, my trying and self-effort to impress or win him. I'm living for Jesus. Hallelujah. I've got my cross. I've got my Jesus banner. I'm standing out in front of the church. I'm standing at the pulpit. Uh, boy, don't I look sharp today. I, I'm, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm living for Jesus. Look at me. What a great Christian I am. I'm living for Jesus. Wow. This is just me trying to show off and make myself holy, which I never can. This is all about my glory, not his glory. 
Even when I say this is all to the glory of God, it can be stated with a subtle, well, you know, hey, this is all for the glory of God, but look at me. I'm telling you about it. You know, give me credit, folks. But we give God the glory, but give me some credit. I hooked it up. I worked it out. Man. Am I, aren't I so amazing? Aren't you glad I'm the pastor of this church? Good night. No, 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 no. No, that's that's living for Jesus. But then there's living um, in Jesus. Living for Jesus, that's a spiritual dead-end road. <coughs> because it makes me big and makes him small. Did you hear me? Living, living for Jesus is a dead-end street. Because it makes me big and... Uh, it makes him small. It reduces the scale of goodness. John said, <laughs> I, must in, I must decrease and he, Jesus, must increase. I must decrease and Jesus must increase. So let's talk about moving from living for Jesus to living in Jesus. Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of our own poets have said. So, for in him we live and move and have our being. It, it Say it like this, but for the grace of God. Because I am what I am because of the grace of God. Philippians 4.13 says this, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. John 15.5 says this, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Jesus said, I'm the vine. You guys, all you, you're all branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Uh, our administrator's family has put up a, a vineyard. And uh, they're having a bumper crop the first year. They were told that don't expect much the first year. But the elements, the rain, the humidity, the, the, the heat has just been spot on for growth of these, uh, of these grapes. And uh, so you look at the you know, first thing you do is that you plant the vine, and it's just a little bitty thing, just a twig looks like, and it's stuck, and it's and there's 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 wire, ropes, um, a lattice, uh, some kind of trellis. That's what it's called, trellis. And so after, you know the rains come, and there's irrigation they put in, and but this summer is just, God has just been pouring. Isn't it something we can water with the city water? the city water and it hardly grows but boy you let god put in the rain his water down untreated unfiltered just pure water from heaven man it and they're having a great crop but it started with that vine that vine and then it, offshoots come and then from the offshoots become grapes i don't know what you call it, clusters clusters of grapes and uh hey if that if that branch is not tied into the vine no bearing of fruit. So we need to uh, have this game plan of, of living uh, in Christ, not living for Christ. Here's another verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he saith unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. See, God loves it when we come to him weak and broken. That's where he wants us. And we say, God, I can't do this in and of myself. I need to let go. Remember the rope? We said, you know, if you're, in, if you're at the end of your rope, tie a big knot and hang on. And then after you're tired of hanging on and struggling all you can, you're going to be exhausted. Then let go of that knot and fall into the hands of a living God. Listen to 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says this, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. But gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest on me. You know, Lynn is going through a terrible time in her life now. Just less than, uh, I don't know, about eight, well, eight, nine months married. Nine months. They got married on December the 14th of last year. So nine months has passed away, passed by, and uh, glorious nine months, and now pancreatic cancer. And boy, how tough is that? But you know what? As I spoke to her a long time this morning, early this morning, I gave her a call, and uh, she's saying, "I'm resting in Christ. 
I'm depending on Christ. You see, it's when we are the weakest that He becomes the greatest in our lives. And aren't you glad for His grace, unmerited favor? This verse and many more teach the single big takeaway from this lesson. Winning in Jesus, not winning for Jesus. Winning in Jesus. This is me in total dependence, letting Jesus live through me. This is Him growing me in holiness. It really is all His work, the work of Christ and all of Christ's glory. Give it all to Him. It's discovering how weak and broken and messy we can be, isn't it? Rather than quitting in despair, it's best that we cast ourselves, abs our absolute weakness upon the grace of God. I, I promise you, by the authority of the Word of God, He will not let you down. If you're a child of God, He will not let you down. His grace is everlasting. His grace is all sufficient. Romans 12.1 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living note that word a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service hey Porter your reasonable service is to die to self each and every day each and every day to die to self this is, this is my yielding and total surrender to Jesus we have to do it's a living sacrifice and you've heard me say it a thousand times. The problem with the living sacrifice is this. It crawls off the altar around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's why Paul said we have to do this daily. Daily we have to open up God's word. We read it and we have to heed it. And we have to pray. And we have to say, God, I present myself today. This new day, the last day of August, August 31st, 2020, I present myself a living sacrifice. I die to self. Because God knows the next day you're going to need to do it all over again. It's a faith thing. It's not a feeling. It's a faith thing. Are you living by faith? It's not uh, anything but, but a faith thing. Everything you and I do in the Christian life, everything we do is either about our trying to grace Jesus or tr Jesus trying Jesus trying to grace us are we wanting to bless God or do we want God to bless us listen to this God didn't save you so you could grace him he saved you so he could grace you boy I'd much rather <laughs> you know have the grace of God not my grace to Jesus but God's grace upon my life and quite frankly That's bottom line, isn't it? It's bottom line. It's, it's but for the grace of God. I keep saying that, but it's so true. God wants it all in totality to, to be about Jesus. He wants it all to be about Jesus and his grace in us. Jesus doesn't need your grace. He doesn't need my grace. <laughs> I need his grace. You need his grace. We treat salvation like a steroid oftentimes that made us able to get it done for him. Well, we got it done for we got it done for Jesus. In reality, salvation is not a modest power boost. People drink these these reds or whatever they call it, these power drinks loaded with caffeine. Get you pumping, get you going. Be careful with those. Don't even get in them. It's a total rescue from absolute destitution and utter helplessness man I, but here it goes again I keep saying it I'm sorry but but I'm not but for the grace of God that that is who I am today humbly who I am today it's not Tom Porter it is not Tom Porter it's the grace of God there's things that God has asked me to do that I absolutely did never, I never wanted to do. Well, one thing was I never wanted to live in Florida. But back in 1982, God called me to Lake Wells, Florida. I lived in Lake Wells, or I lived in Florida for th almost three years in high school, my last three years of high school. I didn't like sand, didn't like going to beach to eat. I like to go to beach to swim and surf. Did a lot of surfing over here in Cocoa Beach. We'd drive over on the 
Then it was called the B, B line. With the top down and the surfboards in the back of a Volkswagen convertible. Love to do that. But I, I didn't like, you know, getting sand in my shoes or sand in my hot dog on the beach cooking out. Just don't like sand. It's too hot. I love the mountains. I love the four. I especially love the four seasons. Fall is my favorite season. Love all of that. I tell you, it's so much better to live in Jesus instead of living for Jesus. Apostle Paul said, I'm, I'm to be the content in whatever state I'm in. And he's not talking about Arkansas, Tennessee, or Alabama. He's talking about what state you're in, you know, how you are, where you're at, mentally, physically, things like that. But I, I, I am. I, I love Florida. God's given me. What I love about Florida is the ministry God's called me in to the people. That's what I love about Florida. There's people. We have close friendships here. We have built relationships with the grace of, by the grace of God. And so I thank you for uh, your faithfulness uh, to God. So next week, we're going to conclude this lesson number 10. This is lesson 10B today. And uh, we're going to see, well, what's the game plan? What's God's game plan? God's game plan for real Christianity goes against everything that you probably naturally would think of. So I want you to tune in next week. And here it is Monday. I never get one early like this. But uh, next week, we'll, we'll look at, look at that. Um, what is God's game plan for us? And uh, it's pretty phenomenal. The love of Jesus is one of the topics. Now, aren't you glad for the love of Jesus? And then to walk with Jesus. We love Jesus, and then we must walk with Jesus. Somebody said, well, God created me to serve him. No, God created you to walk with him. <laughs> God created us for him to walk with us. And he walks with me, and he talks with me. He walked with uh, Adam in the in the in the in the cool of the morning. He created us for fellowship. Emmanuel, God with us. God always wants to be with us. That's his heart's. That that's where he's at. And you know what? <laughs> We're living in hell, right? Well, not literally. You know, you understand. But it's 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 messed up. It's messed up. This world is upside down. But the Bible told us it would be that. The Bible said that. And I'm going to preach it now, so let me let it go. Uh, <laughs> the Bible said that there will come a time when good will be evil spoken of. And are we not seeing that now? If, if you can't see that, you are spiritually and blind to the fact. We are living in a world now that good is evil spoken of. And evil is spoken well of. We need God. If you know somebody today that doesn't know Christ, hey, would you send them a truelife.org card? Would you send them a bridge track? Will you call them and give them a card? Will you write it out longhand and lick it and stick it and put it in snail mail? Whatever it takes, give people the gospel. People need the Lord. God bless you. Until next time, and I hope to see you Wednesday night. Uh, and we're studying the book of Romans, but on our prayer meetings on Wednesday nights, we're doing something pretty novel. <laughs> we do the prayer first. We have prayer time first. And then if there's if there's if there's time for a lesson, we'll kick that lesson in. Last week we went straight through in prayer. We prayed the whole hour. After singing time and some announcements, we prayed the rest of the time. Because we we're a needy people and we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for the leadership of this nation. There's much to pray about. And so we don't want the Wednesday night prayer meeting to be something we just throw in the last two minutes after the lesson. We're going to pray first. God moves his hand when the people of God go to him in prayer. So I hope to see you 6.30 this Wednesday night. It'll be a blessing to you. I'd love to see you there. Some of you aren't coming at all. Come on. There's a good crowd there. We meet in Mark Woolley's classroom. And uh, we check your temperature. We observe social distancing. All of that stuff. But uh, you come and at 6.30. And then on Sunday, we have a service at 11 a.m. And uh, men's prayer breakfast will be on the second Saturday, 8 o'clock, second Saturday of this month. I encourage you men to come out 
and uh, and spend a season of prayer with us in the morning. And then we have our deacons and trustees meeting after that. So, hey, God bless you. I'm right at 30 minutes and two seconds. God bless. Bye-bye.